the much awaited conversation with the legend sadguru is finally here the last time i spoke to him it was 2018 i was a very different person the questions i had the thoughts i had were extremely different as compared to my perspectives at this stage in life it's been 2 and a half to 3 years of a lot of knowledge absorption and i hope that if you enjoyed that conversation that we had back then you'll enjoy this conversation even more it's aimed at all the gen z's out there it's aimed at college students it's aimed at young professionals and above all it's aimed at the leaders of the human race in the future why because this conversation touches upon a lot of topics including the save soil movement what is the save soil movement sadguru will tell you himself on the show but what's to be noted is that because of climate change because of deforestation because of pollution caused by human beings soil all over the world is losing its quality and therefore that means that we might face an entire phase of food shortages and famines all over the world in as less as 40 years from now this and more on this very crucial conversation with sadguru on the ranveer show enjoy yourselves follow us on spotify trs is a spotify exclusive which means that every episode is available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world this conversation is going to blow you away if spiritual conversations are what you're in the search for namaskaram enjoy the episode with sadguru namaskaram <laughs> sadguru <laughs> just i think this has already become one of the most fascinating moments of my life being in the middle of nature speaking with you so um, you know I, i last spoke to you in like this in 2018 i feel like i was a child back then i feel i'm little older of a child now <laughs> <laughs> um but that night i i mean that that conversation had such a deep impact on me because of the things you answered my questions with like the the answers you gave gave me the answers i needed exactly at that point in time and that night i actually had a dream about you this time i'll treat you like an adult okay <laughs> happy happy to <laughs> happy to just be next to you and be talking to you doesn't matter how you treat her. um this is, this is the thing with me even if they're 70 years of age i treat them like children and they slowly become like that with me <laughs> that is the whole thing with time people are getting crusted mm that is the whole thing about life that you don't get trusted and rusted just because of time mm. <laughs> no uh, i agree so uh-huh. i'll still treat you as a child okay happy happy <laughs> and honored to happy and honored to be treated like a child sadguru it it just breaks my heart that i'm having such a beautiful moment here with you and uh, our world is in the middle of a war right now um, not the world only two nations two But, nations no no it's very important we don't exaggerate this because we should never move into that thing about two world wars have happened we should never ever move in that direction conflict should not happen but in case it happens at least it must be contained everybody should not jump into it what do you think goes on in those few men's minds you know the ones who are the decision makers why would you consciously choose to go to war it can't just be for economic reason there has to be a no. thought of ego as well i feel see uh, these are very superfluous judgments but we must understand all this is rooted in our strong sense of identity and we want our identity to dominate somebody else's identity so nationhood is a very strong identity the identity is consciously built and encouraged to a point that you are willing to shed your life for your nation which is always considered a great virtue right If I am willing to shed my life for my nation, I am also willing to take your life for that. That is a natural process. Whether it is nation, race, religion, caste, creed, or even your individuality, if you are unnecessarily identified, you will get into unnecessary levels of friction and conflict. Um, Sadhguru, but isn't identity just another word for ego? Like I've I've constantly been thinking lately a lot about this concept of ego. the more you think about see when you say it's a concept of ego that means you made it up why do you make it up mm. <laughs> okay fair fair um my my follow up question i didn't make it up so i don't have it 
These are these are the kind of answers I just play with my head. Okay, and I'm not ready for the next question yet, but I'm still gonna throw it at you. So okay, the next the next question, honestly, is the other kind of concept that fascinates me a lot in this world, and kind of still makes me feel bittersweet about the times that we live in. It's this concept of Gen Z, which is Generation Z, which means kids that are roughly born okay, after ninety seven. Wait, wait, wait. If you're Generation Z, don't ever say that because that means you're the last generation. <laughs> well, that's one thing I'm trying to avoid, that you should not be the last generation. What does Gen Z mean, huh? So, Z so, is the last word, last <laughs> alphabet. I, I think, I think culturally, I am a millennial because I'm born <laughs> pre-97. I am also 20th century millennial. <laughs> no, I, th I think... <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, millennia are you talking about? I, I think those are the cultural kind of terms given to... All right, but don't use the word Gen Z. That means you are the last generation. Please don't be that. <laughs> okay, we'll call fine, you Gen... Fine. Zen... Uh, you know, Gen A. Okay. I, I think the next one's called Gen Alpha. <laughs> Just... Uh, we, we go back to the start. Oh, okay. It's a circular moment of alphabets. <laughs> So, so I, I work... Once you learn the alphabets, you must go into words. Once you get the words, you must go into sentences. Once you go into sentences, you go into literature. Okay, don't keep on re repeating the alphabets, man. <laughs> um, I, I work with a lot of these Gen Zs and some Gen Alphas. What I notice about them is that... Ask them to find a different name. <laughs> Gen Z is dangerous, huh? <laughs> it means you're the last generation. Don't I, do that. Yeah, I, I think it's a cool sounding name. Maybe, maybe in, in our heads as, as youth. But anyway, uh, so, so the one thing I notice about them is that they're incredibly intelligent. Far more intelligent than my generation was at that age, 17, 18. And you talk to some 13, 14 year olds and, and they're even smarter than this Gen Z generation. So I look at them as like both blessed and slightly cursed. Cursed because... We're living in the times of the virus. We're living in the times of this particular incident we spoke about, like the war. And then we're also living in the times of ecological damage. The good thing about Gen Z and Gen Alpha is that they're way more environmentally conscious, they're way more intelligent, they're way more strategic. They know how to use technology, design, social media much better. But I'm very curious to kind of think of their trajectory in this world. What kind of world are they heading into? See, uh, every generation thinking they are special is a very bad thing. Unfortunately, every generation thinks they are special. So we come from the sixties, the sixties generation thought they are really special people, <laughs> all right? <laughs> and they became a disaster. Don't go in that direction because this thing thinking, this generation is more intelligent, that generation is more conscious, it's not like that. Because by doing that, you're shirking your individual responsibility. What do you mean? See, you got to be smart. My generation is smart, what does it mean? Whether you're smart or dumb is the only question that matters, isn't it? <laughs> Whether you're conscious or not is what ma... Oh, we... our generation is more conscious, there's no such thing. You... It, this is the whole... People find thousand different ways as to how to shift the fundamental responsibility of being human to something else and something else. You're talking about Gen Z can handle their phone better than me. Maybe it's true because that's what they were born with. I could climb a tree better than any Gen Z, huh? Probably even now I can do it better. I can ride a motorcycle better than most Gen Zs, huh? <laughs> So what I'm saying? Whatever was available to us in our times, we've become good with it. That doesn't make us smarter. What world are they heading into though? Like, what do you think is in store for us over the next 10, 20 years? Well, if they're only looking at the phone screen or the computer screen, they're heading into a wall. You need to look up and see where is life going around you. It's very important. You're misunderstanding technology and, uh, you know, the screen space as a reality. No, it's a... technology is a wonderful tool, only if you use it consciously. Mm. If you become unconscious and compulsive about it, today in United States, they've set up uh, technology de-addiction centers, okay? Just like drug de-addiction, technology de-addiction. They're going crazy with technology. Are technology has done wonders to me. We're doing hundred times the work that we were doing uh, maybe fifteen, twenty years ago. 
simply because of technology. I think it's a great thing, but somebody else is suffering that. Human beings are even suffering their own brains, isn't it? If they didn't have a brain, they would be peaceful. Because they have a brain, they think stress, stress, stress. Because you don't know how to handle the highest technology which is here. On this planet, the greatest technology on the planet is the human mechanism. People who don't know how to handle it, people who never read the user's manual, they are suffering their body and their mind. I, I have two follow-up questions to this. Yes, sir. The first one is, are you familiar with the whole metaverse revolution that's happening? And the it's second... It's not a revolution. <laughs> I've heard about metaverse. I know what... Metaverse. Yeah, it's like virtual reality. Worse. <laughs> that's... That's the, that's the follow-up question. That's the, the second question. I'm not against any technology. I'm for it. Hmm. Only if you know how to consciously handle it. See, right now, isn't this metaverse? Yeah. Hello? That's, that, that's, that was the question, like, um, you know, I, I, I just hope that the technologies of the future don't take us away from nature because we are living in a beautiful civilization. Because you'll be wearing those uh, VR glasses and you will completely not look at the world. Yeah. See, right now, if you pay enough attention to this, this is super metaverse, believe me. People have never paid attention. I've lived in jungles, spent weeks together just by myself. What's happening here? Not simple. Even today when I'm talking about the soil, everybody's saying, Sadhguru, how did you become an environmentalist? From where? I think it's quite vulgar to call yourself an ecologist, environmentalist, whatever. I'm not saying in scientific... as a scientific terminology. Generally, people calling themselves because you are a part of the ecology. You are a part of the environment. How the hell did you assume that you're above it and you're going to fix something? You are part of it. You're just outcome of it, isn't it? What's happening in the soil and who you are is just a reflection. It's a consequence of what's happening there. So, we assume this distance, especially if you wear these VR glasses and walk around all the time, you will never see life around you, nor experience life around you. So, all you are having is uh, like a psychedelic experience. At that time, during my time, everybody was doing that with LSD. Well, twelve, thirteen of my friends died doing these things. I thought they always said, I will kill myself on my motorcycle, but I'm still here. They did drugs and they thought that is better because they were seeing worlds that didn't exist. And many of them died. Others got sick. So, they were doing metaverse with chemicals. <laughs> You're doing metaverse with technology. All that will happen is your mind will get distorted because the mind is a reflection of what you're exposed to. If you're more and more exposed to the unity and the harmony of the creation, that's how your mind will become. If more and more you're exposed to all these aberrations, however great it is in terms of creating, it's entertainment means you do it one or two hours, that's a different thing. But if you think that is a new world and you bu people are buying real estate, hello? People are buying real estate in metaverse. <laughs> there can't be a dumber thing than that, okay? See, you buy a real estate in the false world. False estate, it's not a real estate. <laughs> <laughs> Especially after the conversation I heard of yours with Prajita right now, just before this, where you were kind of dishing out pieces of truth from the near future where you said that 90% of uh, the organic content in soil has deteriorated all over the world. You know, you, you spoke a lot about generally the deterioration of our planet. I feel like that's the pertinent issue, but people don't focus on all the holes in the boat. They just focus on making the boat larger and larger. And you know, we're speaking about uh, billionaires of the world, like Elon Musk, all these people, they're trying to colonize Mars, they're trying to do all that terraforming. But here our planet is getting affected. And I feel that's the issue that Gen Z needs to talk about a lot more. Sorry, Gen whatever, Gen... Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but the younger folks need to know these truths. You can call them, instead of Z, a closer term would be C, Gen <laughs> Confused. <laughs> that's not a popular thing to say, but I'm telling you, this is very important that you don't label yourself. Already people are putting enough labels on you. 
you are Indian, you are brown, you are white, you are this religion, that religion, that caste, this creed, all kinds of rubbish labels they're putting on you. Don't put one more label on yourself, because every label will restrict you in some way, isn't it? Mm. Will it not? Yeah, yeah. So don't put any labels. Why don't you just live here as a living thing, breathe and exist? and reverberate at the highest possible level, that's all you can do with life. Rest is all your imagination. Do not misunderstand your imagination as reality, this is very important. If you confuse psychological reality as existential reality, you will suffer immensely in your life. This is what is happening to people, what is it that they're suffering? Or is somebody putting pins into your body? No, you're just suffering your own mind, isn't it? The greatest thing that's happened on this planet, if you ask me, in terms of technology and in terms of possibility, is human mind. But you suffer that all the time. And uh, if I say, it doesn't matter whether you were born yesterday or you were born hundred years ago, if you are suffering your own mind, you are Gen C. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how do we get people generally to just be a part of the Safe Soil movement. After your chat with Prajakta, I have understood the significance of it. But my question, maybe this is a capitalistic question, but how do we actually grip people's attention and tell them, listen, this is what's wrong with the planet? See, first thing is, uh, the younger generation needs to understand food comes from land. Your body that you carry, which matters to you, this comes from land, this is land, this is called human, because this is a consequence of the humus in the land. So take some time to find out how much humus is left, wherever you are. You're living in a city, everything is paved, all right? Paved land and plowed land, disaster on the planet. It is very important, soil is a recycle all the time. Dead life is going into it and life is coming out of it. The most miraculous thing about soil is this. The miracle of the soil is that nowhere in this entire universe is there a place where you can sow death and it sprouts life, bursts out with life. Bury something dead here and just see in a few days how much life will be happening around it. Tell me, show me one place in the entire universe where this can happen. So right now, the kind of things people are imagining up, making up in their minds is... Uh, about a week ago, there is somebody who's got a startup, okay? If you pay 1.7 million dollars to him, when you die, you can book it right now. When you die, whenever you die, they will take your body and leave it in the space. Because there's no oxygen out there and there's no microbial life, your body will not rot, it'll just remain the same way. For millions of years, your body can float around in the space. Maybe you can catch a ride on some spaceship. <laughs> I'm saying, the body that you carry is essentially soil. If you did not do anything eco-friendly, at least when you die, you must put it back where it belongs. Hello? That's the simplest thing you can do. But today, they're putting them in boxes and preserving them in buildings, like uh, parking lots they've built for people to be stored in boxes. This box belongs to your grandmother, you can go and put flowers there. What is the point of preserving a dead body? It must go back, because we have no business, it's a loan that we have taken. We have to put it back when our job is done, isn't it? So, doing these kind of things is all coming from the ignorance of how life happens. Life, you know, if you utter the word carbon, everybody thinks something noxious, something poisonous today because of so much talk happening in the social media about carbon, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. Carbon is life. You and me are carbon life. Ah, this tree is carbon life. Every animal is carbon life, isn't it? This entire world, life, the fundamental material for life is carbon-based. And right now, what you call as life on one level is just a whole carbon cycle. If there is a chain, if there is a chain which is making something, let's say 
motorcycles have changed, you know, the, these days these chains that we have today on these motorcycles, modern motorcycles, they don't give us so much trouble. Otherwise, when I was riding motorcycle, every 500, 600 kilometers, you have to check your chain because it'll become loose. If you ride like that, it'll come off and cause a disaster for you, okay? Every 600 kilometers, 700 kilometers, you have to check it. Thousand kilometers, you have to take off a link because the material was such... Today, modern chains are made in such a way, we un... we're just not bothered, we're simply riding. There also you must maintain, but when you're on a single trip, you don't have to bother. So a chain, any chain, is a cycle, like that. Any chain is only as strong as an individual link. You don't have to break the whole chain. If you break one link, it's gone, right? Right now, this chain, the carbon chain is going on, all right? To keep the life going, that's the only way life is going. But the agricultural soil on the planet, which is one big link in the chain, has become too weak. If that breaks, life is not going to be good. Life, you can order from your... Uh, your food from Swiggy, Piggy, wherever you like it. But somebody has to cook it, right? Somebody is cooking the food. The delivery mechanism won't deliver it to you. Somebody is cooking the food, somebody is growing the food. Delivery can happen on technology app. Do not misunderstand the delivery as the source. You're eating food not because of a food app. You're eating food not because of a store. You're eating food not because of your kitchen. You're eating food only because of the richness of the soil. If you don't understand this, we will pay a serious price. Unfortunately, in the last thirty, forty years, we have missed this point and caused enormous damage to the soil, where sixty-two percent of India's soil has less than point-five percent organic content. This is on the verge of desertification. We are partners with UNCCD, the UN Agency to Combat Desertification. This is the biggest concern right now. The world is turning into a desert. If people don't understand how it turns into a desert, Saudi Arabia means you see a desert, right? Ten thousand years ago, it was a rainforest. Gujarat was a, you know, well-endowed forest. Rajasthan was a forest. When the Saraswati River flowed on the surface, all these were forests. The moment it was deprived and certain things changed and people did not understand what was happening, they all turned into harsh deserts. This is what will happen. It is not that tomorrow morning there'll be sand dunes in your neighborhood. That's not the point, because then you may think it's very romantic, you can go and sing a song there, <laughs> uh, like a movie star or something. That is not how it'll happen. Food production will slowly slide. It's not like one day suddenly there'll be no food. It slowly slides. Even today, for all of you young people who are well-to-do, who, who have choice of foods to eat, I want you to understand every day, even today, 820 million people go to bed without food. It's expected by 2032, nearly one and a half billion to two billion people will be going to bed without food. It's ex expected by 2045, nearly three to 3.5 billion people will be going to bed without food. Is that what you want to do? And what makes you think it won't be you? What is a guarantee? It's not you. We you always think these things happen to somebody else. No, no, it'll happen to you and me. I've been reading a lot of historians' work like Graham Hancock, Yuval Noah Harari, and they keep talking about how history is so deep that there's no way we can even know what happened b before 10,000 years or 20,000 years. So I always think that maybe there were civilizations that actually made some wrong moves from an environmental perspective mm -hmm. and Mother Nature came to bite back. Do you think this is another cycle, like oh. just like that? See, it has happened. Not on the scale it's happening now, because now it's global. Mayan civilization collapsed because they over-farmed. Mesopotamia, one of the greatest civilizations in the world between two rivers, that collapsed because of over-farming. Rome as a civilization collapsed because of over-farming. Because those days there was no massive transportation systems like railways or ships and things like that, once they could not grow food, that city would collapse. 
Today we can say you are not growing any food in Mumbai, all right, but you can good get food from all over the world. But how long do you think it'll work? Without the needed food growing around you, how long will it work? And once there is a shortage in that source, they will stop sending food to you. Already it's happening to many places. Okay, the next question I'm going to ask might sound a little rude. And I apologize. I'll also be rude, no problem. That's that's fine. <laughs> uh, you're allowed to be rude, yeah. But uh, um, and and I'm asking you this from the perspective of me studying a book called the Garud Puran lately, which speaks about death. So. Oh, you're thinking what punishment I should get? Is it? No, no, no. I'm. It it got me thinking about my own death and everything I wanted to do before my death. So all these campaigns you're taking on, where be it Save Soil, be it Kaveri Calling. Are you doing it from a perspective of you want to create an impact in the next 20, 30 years? Because you're you're doing some extreme stuff like the 30,000 kilometer bike ride. It's 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 harsh on anyone's body. So it gets me thinking that firstly, Sadhguru, it's a two prong question. I'm I'm very sorry if this is coming <laughs> off as rude, but I'm curious. Do you ever think about your own, you know, the, 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 your own moment in time? And, and secondly, how do my, you... My moment in time, I'm fully sorted out on that, completely sorted out. I don't have such bother at all in life. Do you think about it at all? No, because I will decide that moment. I'm not thinking it'll happen like that to me. What, what are you waiting for? Huh? Why, why... You're asking why am I not dead? Why have you not chosen... <laughs> why have you not chosen it yet? <laughs> Well, still the water is flowing, uh, people around me are still thirsty to know and to grow. If they show little boredom in front of me, I'll be gone. They better know that. Yes, that's um, how simple it is for me. People who sit in front of me, if they show boredom, they think, what is he talking about? Well, I'll be gone. Okay, I met you four years ago and uh, again, this is going to be a slightly rude question and I apologize to like everyone here. Um, you know, I, I, I see what you're trying to do. I've, I've visited the ashram, I've, I've, I've come to Coimbatore, I've seen all the work that's going on, I've seen the energy of everyone and there's a lot of good intent here, especially when it comes to the environment. Especially Not a lot of good intent, only good intent. There's only, there's only good intent here. <laughs> And you have people in the world of politics, people in the world of media, I would even say the entire left wing of the country always trying to pull you down. I feel those same people, there's pockets of it which try to pull me down as well. And I'm, by the way, I'm called Gen Z Sadhguru, <laughs> which is like, which is, which is like, I, I feel embarrassed. But, you know, these kind of narratives are out there. So, how do you perceive all that, sir? Like, what do you, what do you make of that situation when you're trying to do so much good and people are misinterpreting you, they're trying to pull you down because I'm actually asking you this from, from my own perspective, if I could learn something. See, uh, if you are very clear that what you're doing is significant for every life around you, other people's opinion means nothing. But, but... I'm saying for thirty years plus, they've been saying the same things. They're not even creative, they're not able to come up with anything new. <laughs> All right, same things they are saying. But they've not gotten anywhere because they have no substance. There's no substance to anything that they have said. So, it's unfortunate that they are in that state. But uh, what I see is uh, every daily mystic quote is there, you know, daily quote. All these people are just waiting. One thing that they don't understand, suddenly all of them will get together and make it... Uh, make the Twitter trend. I'm so glad. Because every day they're reading my quotes, even people who are here are not reading. <laughs> they're reading, okay. I'm saying every day carefully they're reading my quote. The day they don't understand, they think I've made a mistake. And boom, they'll go. I'm glad. I have worked in prisons, both in India and United States. I have worked with hardcore criminals who have come for murder, rape, worst possible things that a man can do, for those things they have come. 
And uh, I've seen significant transformation with... Uh, in their lives, simply because of two days or five days of contact with me. These guys are continuously following me, I'm very confident one day they will be very transformed. I wish them the best. But uh, my... you know, it's not just about the opinion, Sadhguru. I feel if you are in the middle of your own purpose, sometimes people yes, will Yes, even... it unfortunately takes a certain amount of energy, time, resource to handle this. But, uh, see, they also enhance the message. Mm. Any publicity is good publicity. I don't think this is publicity. I've never looked for publicity. Actually, people may find this difficult to understand. I'm an extremely uh, private person, really. I'm public because I consider all of them as part of myself, only in that sense. Otherwise, I'm not public in any sense. So, it takes a certain amount of, uh, you know, in your stride, a little bit of extra... It's like you're walking and somebody hangs onto your leg. You still have to walk. You walk, but they are lightweight. Mm. It's okay. I'm saying, uh, with all whatever they've been doing for twenty-five years, they're not able to prove one point and say, okay, this has actually happened. How long will people believe this kind of trash endlessly? Slowly they're losing their traction, they're feeling stupid. Many of them have started following us in a positive way. Many journalists who... from LO magazines and stuff, who started this whole scandalous thing about us, today they're all devotees here. Others will come. <laughs> What do you think is that person's journey who has that much anger in their heart? See, like... some of them are genuinely angry because... because there is bitterness in them. From their own life? Yes. Lack of being significant in the world. This is not just about me. They're attacking sports people, they're attacking actors, they're attacking artists. Anybody who's successful, they're attacking them because they're anti-success. They want to succeed, but I, they must have failed repeatedly in their lives, in everything that they do. Now, anybody who is successful, they want to pull them down. Who, just tell me who's been spared, which arena of life has been spared. Politicians who are elected, they will pull them down. Sports persons who are very super successful, they pull them down. Spiritual people, of course, <laughs> the thing is on. But they don't pull down all the spiritual people. If they're ineffective, if they're not a big success, they're not pulling them down, they're not disagreeing with them, yeah. all right? So they're essentially, you know, rankled by somebody's success, which shows lack of significance in their own life. I wish them success so that they can relax and be positive about life. Sir, I'm very hopeful about India going forward as a country. I feel it'll be a change maker in this world. Um, they say that India is the spiritual capital of this earth. I don't know if that's true, I would like to believe it. A big aspect of being spiritual, I feel, is being loving. And we're seeing so much me versus you in this country, as no. not me versus you. No, I no, would no, no. <laughs> let's, let's settle this. Who told you being spiritual is being loving? Isn't it about spreading love? Then, uh, then get a dog, then dogs are really spiritual, is that what you're saying? Dogs are very loving, come on. I mean... Is Tell it... me, yes or no? Yes, sir. They're very loving. So, they're all spiritual? I don't... Don't wag your tail all the time and you're spiritual? <laughs> Please don't do that <laughs> But, sir, like, how do we get the country united? Because I feel that repeatedly our country has been invaded and affected and brought down because of this whole divide and rule policy. People caught on to the fact that we play a lot of me versus you. So, again, for the next twenty, thirty years, how do we work on that aspect of unity to build businesses, to build movements, to save soil, to help the environment? Because I feel that we've been given a gift to be born in this country and we're not valuing it enough as a unit. And there's too much ego, there's too much anger, there's too much hate, especially post the pandemic. So, what's your advice here? See, uh, don't judge the whole country by looking at a television screen or a social media platform. No, just walk around here, just walk around in this village or in the city. 
You don't find anybody in anger. You don't find anybody beating up somebody, do you? No. No such thing happening. Some incidents happen, 1.3 billion people, some incidents here and there happen, unfortunately. Lives are lost, injuries have been caused to other people, which definitely needs to be dealt with. There is no one way to deal with that, there is uh, law enforcement, there is a certain sense of harmony in the society, all these things matter. These are not overnight jobs, this is something we need to strive for. As you said, history, historically, uh, we've gone through a whole riga of invasions, worst kind of invasions. We've not documented it very well as other cultures have, but we have gone through and taken a beating that very few uh, populations in the world have taken, most cruel kind of battering we have taken. But we're still not bitter, that is what is beautiful about us. People have come, subjugated us, made us feel like, you know, you even have to pay a tax for being who you are, all this, but we are not bitter. That is a great thing, okay? We are not bitter. Yesterday what happened, for that we are not bitter. But making sure that doesn't happen again to us tomorrow is also equally a responsible thing to do for which we are building a strong nation right now. We should have done it sooner, it's seventy-five years now, but uh, we are doing it a little slow, but for the size of the country and the diversity of the nation that we are, I think we are doing well. Do you think fiction, films, stories are a good way to unite the country? Because that's my only hope, honestly. Or sport, oh, that's the other one. Definitely. We must use every means. I do not ascribe to this, that this is the way. Everything that we do, we must see how people can transcend the smallness of their boundaries and see at least we if not boundless, at least a larger boundary which includes most people. So, if you don't strive for that, your life will naturally be constantly in conflict with something or the other. For the well-being of the individual and the well-being of the society and the nation, it's very important that there is a larger identity with which we can move forward. It is happening, it is just that it's not being projected well. See, after the pandemic, you mentioned the pandemic, it was a serious hit, okay? Especially in a country like ours, the economic cost has been so serious, most people don't understand. I'm in huge appreciation of the lowest level work... from the lowest level of worker. What I've seen is from a police constable, from a village official, to panchayat leaders and even political leaders and right up to the state governments and central government. What they've done in these two years, I bow down to them, really. You can go on picking what didn't go well. But in a country like ours, where infrastructure is so minimal, the way we have delivered the vaccine uh, solution and the way we have taken care of people, there have been aberrations, but such a large country with such little infrastructure, country like United States with such massive infrastructure and such massive amount of fund, see, they're still shaking, still shaking. You know, I know so you... So, every one of us must be in absolute gratitude from the... because we don't know who did what. From the doctors, nurses, small, you know, police constables, everybody strived to manage this. It's not a small thing. It is not a small thing, 1.3 billion people, if what this person speaks one language, that person speaks another language, dozens of languages, you can't communicate in one language to everybody how to communicate a message, how to make them behave responsibly, how to even wear... May wear a mask. People are carrying... Uh, you know, people's level of understanding is like this. People are carrying a mask in their pocket. They think it's like a driving license. When I ask them, where is your mask? You're coming so close. They say, I got it, Sadhguru, I got it in my pocket. Here in my hip pocket. I said, it doesn't work on your bum, you got to have it on your nose <laughs> I'm saying... <laughs> I'm saying in this kind of country, to effectively manage a pandemic and come out of it successfully, and having a thriving economy as we're having right now, is not a small thing. So for this, 
it's not just one prime minister, one chief minister, one somebody. Everybody has strived, isn't it? From the smallest man to the biggest man, everybody has strived. Let us not go on giving endless negative com commentary. Appreciate the nation. If you can't appreciate the administration, appreciate the nation. We've bounced back, right? Mm. It's not a small thing. Yes, sir. So, maybe I, I can ask you unlimited questions more, but I know, like, you know, time is tight. I have to ask you about the 30,000 kilometer bike ride you're doing, which I find fascinating. Um, there's someone called Wim Hof, they call him the Iceman. He uses pranayama and aspects of yoga to basically deal with freezing temperatures. And I think the world notices Wim Hof and his abilities. And often they overlook all of India's yogic leaders for their yogic abilities. Uh, um, because uh, we won't do such... I know Wim Hof well, I've been in conversations with him. But I won't do any such uh, circus feats. I mean, sir, but 30,000 kilometers is no joke. 100 kilometers starts hurting your back. I can't imagine what 30,000 kilometers is like on a Well, bike. maybe this is a good ad uh, for yogic back. <laughs> How's that, huh? <laughs> what, what's your opinion on pain with respect to the journey in front of you and generally pain as a concept? Pain is not a concept. If you don't know that it's not a concept, I can cause some pain to you. You will know it's not a concept. It's a living reality when you get it. Hello? Can huh? pain be controlled by the mind? See, pain is of the body. If there was no pain, see, suppose this water is hardly nine inches deep, all right? Nine, ten inches deep. But you want to dive from the top of the tree. If there was no pain, you would have done it. Yes? If it... if it breaks your head and still there's no pain, a whole lot of people would have done it. Right now, the only thing which is making you behave sensibly, at least in terms of your survival, is pain. Without pain, most people would not know how to survive either. So pain is a very good thing, it manages you. Even emotional pain? That you cause, because you want to be a tragic hero. <laughs> <laughs> Me? <laughs> no! <laughs> <laughs> See, there is only physical pain as existentially true. Pain that you have in your mind and in your emotion is caused by you. You like to poke yourself. Why? Because you're a way in life. You have not found any other way to feel profound. Pain makes you feel profound. You're from Mumbai, cinema world, I'm saying. Without pain, <laughs> no profoundness, isn't it? You're no, always happy. <laughs> no artistry. <laughs> huh? No artistry. See, people think they're profound because they're in pain. <laughs> no, you're misunderstanding pain for profoundness, it's a serious mistake. If it comes in loads, then you will know what it is, all right? It'll destroy you, it'll mutilate life, pain, yes or no? Human beings have been destroyed, not necessarily by a sword or a gun, they just break themselves down into pieces because of their own emotions and thoughts. More people are mutilating themselves by themselves, using the sharpness of their own mind, rather than by somebody's sword or gun, isn't it so? So why is this so? Because you have misunderstood a few fundamental things. You do not know what is real and what is not. What is existentially true, what is physiologically true, what is psychologically true. You have lost, you know, the boundaries of this. Once you lose this, whatever you do, it'll hurt you. <laughs> Just tell me one thing, people are not suffering. Tell me one thing. Well, if they are poor, they suffer their poverty. You make them rich, they suffer the taxes. <laughs> yes. If they're not educated, they suffer that. Put them to school, they suffer that. Uh, they're not married, they suffer that. Get them married, oh! <laughs> Don't tell me. <laughs> no children, they suffer that. Give them children daily suffering. Yes. 
So it looks like you're suffering every aspect of life. So we'll offer you death. Oh, they'll suffer that. So suffering is not because of life situations. Suffering is because you do not know how to manage yourself. You do not know how to manage your own mind, your emotion, your energy, your... your very life. You do not know how to manage. Then everything becomes suffering. Physical pain is a different thing. Physical pain is caused by some contact or disease or injury or something. That of course we must see how we keep it at the minimum in our life. Mosquito bites you, all right. But you don't have to be bitten by a bear. <laughs> you need to avoid that. <laughs> Why are you taking on the pain of the bike ride? Uh, you are assuming that it's painful. <laughs> it is... it is risky. Not painful, risky. One thing is, I'm riding in the winter, European winter, North... Northern European winter, where it's snowing, probably roads are icy. Being on two wheels on an icy road is not a joke, it's risky. Then I'm coming into Arabia, where temperatures are anywhere between 38 to 40 degrees. I could melt away there like snow. Then I'm entering India in the peak of Indian monsoons. Why someone like me? I can live a good life. I can live a very comfortable life because wherever I go, people will take care of me, any part of the world. If I say tomorrow, I want to live... Uh, what is the most exo exotic place you can think of? Uh... If I say I want to live in the Alps mountain, people will set up a home for me. I don't have to have a dollar only in my pocket. If I say I want to live in Himalaya, somebody will set up a wonderful place for me. If I say I want to live on the ocean, somebody will get a big yacht for me, I'm telling you. I can live very well and very comfortably. Why am I doing this? Because I want all of you young people to understand, if we don't do this now, we will regret seriously and your Generation Z label may come true for half the population at least. If not for the whole population, for half the population it may come true. I want to make sure we have... Li I have well lived very well. Wherever you put me, I... because I never sought comfort. I've slept in the jungles, I've slept on the trees, I've been head to toe by insects. You know, when I came back after two, three weeks of being in the forest, people wouldn't recognize me because head to toe insect bites. You can't recognize me, it's all like this, my face. But I didn't suffer. So I've never sought comfort, so I never suffered. But I've lived an extremely engaging and intense life. And my experience of life is in a way that I will not exchange this for anything in the universe. You give me anything, if you give me a mountain of gold, I will not exchange this. Just now, I was in the United States in Los Angeles. This guy comes and he wants to meet me and he has a presentation to make. I said, what is it about? He said, something about our online properties, he wants to make a presentation. I said, okay, let me see what it is. Then he comes with the presentation and shows what all is on YouTube, what all is on all these things, channels and platforms. Then he says and uh, all these calculations he makes and shows, Sadhguru, if you allow me, I can package all this material and in today's... today's value, it is worth about 2.7 billion dollars. I can package this for you and get you that kind of money in the next few years. I said, what do I do with 2.7 billion dollars? Get me eight billion people, that's what I'm looking for. Right now, for Safe Soil Movement, just get me 3.5 billion people, the job will be done. Do that, huh? And if you... if you get me 25 million uh, Earth Buddies, I'll take you on a ride, <laughs> all right, on the motorcycle. Your back won't break, believe me <laughs> <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Sadhguru, thank you. Um, maybe just one last selfish... selfish question because I don't get this opportunity all the time. Um, do you have any last piece of advice for me or whatever we're trying to do through this show? I know you've kind of got a gist of it through the questions, but uh, just any last piece of advice for my team and myself? See, every generation is remembered 
for things they do, right? See, right now, after fifteen thousand years, we're still talking about Adiyogi. Why? You think because he was tall or handsome or something? <laughs> no, we're talking about him because of the offerings that he made to us, which is still relevant to us, isn't it? You remember a human being through history, either he did something terrible, then you remember him in a wrong way, or they did something with which our lives are still benefiting. As a generation, we have this opportunity, this is a one-time opportunity. In the next ten to fifteen years' time, if we bring about the policy change now, in the next one or two years, and it'll naturally take effect, in next ten to fifteen years' time, we will be remembered as a generation who turned the planet around. It was going, sliding down to a, uh, you know, disastrous place, and we turned it around. We will be remembered for that. You don't have to remember me, because I don't care whether you remember me or not. People ask me, Sadhguru, well, after your time, how should you, how do, how would you like people to remember you? I said, if they are only thinking about me, obviously they're living bad lives, <laughs> all right? <laughs> if they forget me the moment I'm dead, that means uh, my work is successful, they're doing well, they're doing great. You always think it is ungratefulness which make people forget. No, it's joy which makes people forget, you know? Like a, a very wise lady said, uh, you know, she... Uh, she had... Uh, two of her twin girls, she got them married. They went in different directions on their honeymoon. One girl who was a very loving, wonderful girl, never sent a message, never wrote nothing. Two months, no message from her. The other girl, every other day she was sending messages, wanting to call and talk to the mother. So somebody came and asked, how are you girls doing? She said about the other girl who never sent a message, one is doing really fine, others seems to be having some trouble with her husband, <laughs> okay? <laughs> One who is happy, doesn't turn back. One who is really going straight and fast, won't look in the rearview mirror, right? So, I don't want to be remembered. This is possible as a generation. Say, for example, even today in this country, we always talk about the freedom movement, all right? That generation which fought for this nation. Maybe if you were there, you would have also fought. That's a different matter, but you were not there. Somebody fought, we will always remember them, isn't it? Always remember them. Seventy-five years, we still remember them. I'm telling you, even if it's five hundred years later, we will still remember the people who fought for this freedom of this nation, yes or no? Similarly, right now, the facts are not all out yet, we will bring this out in many ways. In how many ways we are at the point of disaster, but we have the opportunity to turn around. You don't have to go and fix the soil. You just have to make your voice loud and clear that enough people, enough people means sixty percent of the world's electorate must speak, 3.5 billion people speak of soil for 100 days from March 21st to 100 days. Do this. I will make sure every government in the world will bring soil-related policies into their policy system. I will do this because I am fully organized with that, UN agencies are with us, I am speaking at the COP15 in Ivory Coast, addressing 170 nations. We will do this, but people need to be there. If people don't care, why will the government do anything? Because the government is there only to manifest people's mandate, isn't it? If people's mandate is not about these concerns, they will not manifest that. That is the responsibility that you have. Use your Wi-Fi and a little bit of your brains. It helps. <laughs> thank you, Sadhguru. <laughs> Namaskaram. <laughs> Bow down to you. And uh, just thank you for the opportunity once again. Thank you. So that was the conversation with Sadhguru. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope it had as much of an impact on you as it did on me. When I've had conversations with Sadhguru in the past, and there've been two conversations, he's always given me some advice which pivoted the way my mind works, which pivoted the way I perceive my own mind. That was the highlight of this conversation for me, where he spoke about the nature of thoughts, and he said that 
there's no such thing as positive or negative thoughts again i don't know if these were his words but this is what i gained from the conversation there's no such thing as positive and negative thoughts they're just thoughts you've got to learn how to separate the sensibility of your soul from the sensibility of your mind overthinking negative thoughts and sometimes even mental health issues are an outcome of giving your thoughts too much importance listening to your overstimulated mind therefore focus on spiritual growth focus on creating distance between your thoughts and your perception before speaking to sadguru before visiting isha foundation coimbatore and uti on this trip i was going through a lot of my own mental health issues a lot of overthinking and i feel like this conversation actually fixed that overthinking for me because after this conversation every time a negative thought came up every time a self deprecatory thought came up every time dark questions came up i started observing the questions from a different place in my mind i realized that hold on these thoughts these sentences are just my mind acting against myself i've got to perceive it and let it go i've got to stay in the moment i've got to practice mindfulness that's what i gained from this conversation it might seem like just words to you but this was very pivotal for me when it comes to my own mental health and according to me in the long term this is going to be a pivotal conversation for my own spiritual growth remember all the spiritual growth that we are seeing as a team we want to share with you folks so keep following us remember to follow TRS on Spotify every episode available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world this month we've got an incredible amount of spiritual conversations coming your way everything from satpal bhai of nanak naam speaking about sikhism to amog leela prabhu of iskon speaking about lots of deep spiritual things i'm not going to reveal too much just watch out for the conversations that are going to follow this particular magical conversation with sadguru namaskaram god bless you